Welcome everybody to another deep adaptation Q&A with me, your host, Professor Jem Bendel. And I'm very pleased this month to welcome Professor Rupert Reed from UEA. He's a professor of philosophy and has been doing a lot of work to stimulate conversation about how very, very difficult our climate predicament is. Uh, and to really encourage us to talk about adaptation. But also, he's been well known, uh, particularly in the UK in the last couple of years, as one of the lead spokespersons for the Climate Action Group Extinction Rebellion. Uh, and um, so, Rupert, thank you uh, very much for, for, for joining us today uh, for a Q&A with members of the Deep Adaptation Forum. It's great to be here, Jim. And it's good to see you. I, uh, when we when we reconnect like this, I I like to think back to um, the early days of. Um, so I met you uh, in September, 2018, at a conference I was organising just after my deep adaptation paper came out, and so you came up to the Lake District and spoke, and it was, yeah, it was really confirmation that. Um, scholars and people who are really leading in the environmental movement, because of course you're quite important in the Green Party as well, that you could actually respond wholeheartedly to this sort of anticipation of disruption and collapse and incorporate it into, into, your, into your narrative, into your work. So that was, that was, knowing you since then has been quite important for me. And obviously I'm very pleased that we've just finished co-editing a book together on deep adaptation. Yeah quality is producing next year. So very pleased to, to have you on. I'm, I'm conscious also that we had to delay this. So um, I was wondering if uh, you just wanted to say something about, about the, the context, because um, um, I mean, we've chatted privately about it, but I think it might, might be helpful for people to hear about sort of the realities of doing the work that we do. Yeah, indeed. So yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, yeah, basically, uh, like um, many people, uh, I've got my own share of personal psychological difficulties uh, in my life. Uh, and that's been the case for a long time. And certainly in the last few years, while I've been um, working hard on um, climate reality, facing up to climate reality on um, potential collapse uh, anticipation uh, and so forth, the um, the last 20 years or so um, have been sort of balanced for me, really, between um, the academic work I've done and the work increasingly in recent years I've done on uh, facing up to climate reality and so forth, and the work I've been doing with Extinction Rebellion, which has completely changed my life, been balanced between that on the one hand and my personal and psychological issues uh, on the other hand. But this summer, um, things took a good turn and the good turn was that I really felt like my private problems, et cetera, I'd kind of dealt with them. Um, they were no longer pressing on me. And I found that I had full attention for the problems of the world for the first time, really for the first time in my life. And I thought, wow, this is great. You know, I'm gonna be able to absolutely focus 100% on uh, the climate emergency and the ecological emergency and so forth. I'm really looking forward to this. So what actually happened? Well, what actually happened is that I found that when there was no balance anymore, um, it wasn't so good. Basically, I found myself thinking and sort of feeling the emergency and the crisis the whole time because I wasn't needing to spend any time looking after myself, etc. Uh, and it was uh, invading my dreams more and more as well. Um, and basically, by the end of the, the summer, I reached a point where I started to have um, personal, psychological, spiritual, etc., problems again because of this. In other words, I found it was unsustainable, it was untenable to be with this stuff the whole time. And well, that's kind of where I've been for the last uh, couple of months. And that's why we had to uh, delay because I was really in very poor shape uh, last month. I'm still struggling uh, now, but not uh, as much. Um, and well, I, I just think it's something I wanted to uh, to share it with this uh, audience because I wouldn't be surprised if it resonates with some people. And in any case, I think it's a sort of quite interesting kind of cautionary 
tale. I mean, one of the lessons I take from this is that we have to be really clear that this is a marathon and not a sprint. You know, this is a condition of our lives that we're talking about and dealing with here. Um, and we know that, but we sometimes don't practice it. And especially sometimes thinking of it as an emergency, if we're not thinking of it as the kind of special kind of emergency it is, namely a unique, long, basically permanent uh, emergency. Um, if, we, if we think of it in a sort of old fashioned way, crudely as an emergency and sort of move into a kind of mode of sort of uh, full attention and indeed to use Greta's wonderful but difficult word, uh, panic, then that can have costs. Uh, and I experienced those costs uh, at the end of this summer. And I've been experiencing the, the impacts of them since. And uh, yeah, it's really brought home to me how somehow in the midst of this crisis, even those of us who want to face up absolutely resolutely, as I absolutely do, to this crisis, we have to find some way of making that sustainable and livable. And we have to keep some kind of balance in our lives otherwise we will really suffer for it and of course if we're not in um, in good psychological condition because we've been undone by the emergency in a sort of eco-psychological way then we can't really contribute uh, fully so I'm delighted to be here today talking about it and I'm you know still battling through uh, etc but yeah I thought it would be perhaps interesting and uh, perhaps resonating uh, and uh, perhaps a, a sort of a kind of a, a warning uh, to people to hear that uh, little uh, version of my story of the last few months. Thank you, Rupert. And it does resonate and um, uh, it resonates in a number of ways with me. One is my own experience over the last few years uh, as I immerse myself more at times in the what what's happening in the world um, yeah but also it resonates with the the conversations i've had with other people and with the the original rationale for creating uh, the deep adaptation forum like a, it's been called by some people like a a crash pad for once you really mm -hmm. uh, hit hit the wall when you wake up to what's happening but it's also a, yeah, it's it's become a real supportive network for people to show up with their difficult emotions in their vulnerability, uh, knowing there aren't simple answers, knowing, as you say, it's a permanent emergency. It's not like we get through this out the other side and we say, well done us. Yeah. This is an aspect. And the, these difficult emotions will be bubbling up from the background. Yeah every so often so how have you how 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 what, what helps you i mean um what, what has helped you the most i mean i i can see that you're you've been incredibly active productive industrious a real spokesperson for this uh for this moment and obviously that level of activity um can be um one way of one way of yeah uh, addressing this otherwise these very difficult emotions but but now that you've taken some some time that you you're a fault you, you don't work with xr right now you're, you've left so yeah how, how what are the other ways that you sustain yourself yeah well so as i say the um I found that the attention, the, the the kind of constant attention, was was making me ill. It was making me uh, anxious. So what I've been mainly trying to do, Jim, <clears throat> is restore more uh, balance to my life, which I've been trying to do already, but I've had to go further. Uh, and what does that mean? It means things like um, I've been seeking to take uh, more time in uh, in wild nature. Uh, it means I've been uh, simply taking more time doing kind of therapeutic uh, work on myself, etc., meditating. And it also means that I've been um, doing things which I haven't done before, I haven't done much before, which are, you know, which are literally nothing to do with anything, if you see what I mean. Things like, for example, I've been watching old episodes of Friends, you know, and uh, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, and it, because it's just a kind of time out. And, you know, it was what I found was that this summer was that I, like I say, I, I was just, I was just stuck 
absolutely fixated on the on the on the crisis and the potentiality uh, for um, collapse. But you know, one of the things that I think is so important to remember is um, is and here, of course, there's a potential difference between us, Jen, which we address in the deep adaptation edited book we've got coming out. Is that part of what I mean when I say this is a this is a marathon, not a sprint? Is that we don't know how long the marathon is going to be, and it could be decades, in in my opinion. John Michael Greer is someone who's looked at this in, in very fascinatingly, um, and he argues that typically uh, collapses uh, take decades or even uh, centuries. Um, so whether we've got a collapse coming or some kind of civilizational uh, transformation that doesn't involve uh, collapse, my view is very much that we don't know how long it's gonna take. We have to be in there for the long haul and for me, for me, that means, <clears throat> excuse me, that means various things, but one of the things it means is things like, I need to have some things in my life, like friends, which are just pure time out and just enable me to, to, to not get stuck in uh, obsessive thinking and mm. worrying about, you know, the, the, the direness of the, of, uh, of the situation. And that's the, that's the paradox of the, um, awesomeness of the depth of emotionally uh, connection that we get with people through uh, waking up to climate reality and so for example the people who joined XR and how brave and amazing that they've all been and how they've supported each other because then of course that means that you're always talking to people <laughs> who are the, you, yeah. the basis for which is the climate crisis so I can see how it can become quite quite dominating Yes. And of course, if you meet people who aren't aware, um, it can feel like, well, you need to, you want to let them into your world and you want to help them to understand your world, but also their world. And, and therefore it's tough, isn't it? It's tough to introduce people to this perspective on the future. So, um, totally. are you giving yourself, uh, some, you're letting yourself just hang out with people who don't know or don't care and, and not trying to persuade them. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, yeah, I'm doing that a little bit more. Yeah, um, you know, I'm I'm basically looking after myself, and it has various dimensions. And among the dimensions are exactly doing stuff and and being with people, which is not connected uh, with this thing. By the way, I should say that's not uh, that's nothing to do really with the reason why I'm stepping back from XR. Well, it's maybe a little bit connected. Um, I'm stepping back from XR initially because I wanted to run this campaign against the, the Murdoch press and I didn't want that to be uh, too deeply associated with XR who are continuing to talk to the Murdoch uh, press because um, they talk to everybody. Um, um, but there are other dimensions too to my decision to step back from XR and you've sort of alluded to, to one of them which is um, which is that I think that XR has been um, not as um, focused as it could have been and as it perhaps should have started to become upon the need for um, adaptation. Uh, and I think that, uh, that, that XR is a little too um, stuck in the groove um, still of thinking, oh, well, you know, 12 years to save the world or five years to save the world or something like that. And part of what hap has been happening to me over the past year is, is becoming more convinced that uh, things are going to get uh, very bad and there's no way around uh, that. The way that we're missing mostly the opportunity for a better um, building back from COVID, the dismal election result in the UK at the general election last year. Okay, we've had a less dismal result in the US uh, now. But you know anybody who thinks that Joe Biden is going to um, stop our trajectory towards uh, climate collapse is is not really living on planet Earth. It seems to me there are a number of reasons I'm afraid which point in the opposite reason uh, in the opposite direction. I'm sorry to the excitement that I've totally been a part of and has been so fantastic around XR and around the school uh, climate strikers. There's a number of reasons for finding this story of XR to be on the one hand a heroic and fantastic one uh, and uh, on the other hand uh, a kind of a sad story in the sense that uh, not surprisingly the results that XR was pushing for 
uh, have mostly not been eventuating. You know, we, XR had the, the extraordinary success that I was so proud to be a part of last year in terms of negotiating with the government and the symbolic declaration of climate emergency and getting a net zero target into law and, and all these things that we could talk about. But you know, what has actually changed? What has actually changed on the, on the ground? How, how much mm -hmm. are, are we slowing down uh, our trajectory uh, towards collapse? You know, the answer is hardly uh, at all. So That's because true. of all that, uh, you know, my view, like, like your view obviously is, we need to be talking about adaptation more. We need to be doing uh, adaptation more. And to the extent that we're not, you know, it's hard uh, not to get um, anxious about it. Yeah, so just quickly, just before we move on, staying with XR, um, uh, is there a possibility that, that there could be a, uh, a set of demands or new demands or some other way that adaptation uh, fair, green adaptation, maybe not even deep, um, could, that could be part of what XR do in future. And, mm. and also then, what more, more clearly, what do you think that flavour of adaptation should be for XR? Yeah, so I talk about this a bit in my, in my recent book, um, Extinction Rebellion Insights from the Inside, uh, which is... Um, available from all very good uh, bookshops, but uh, also available for free download uh, online, which I hope might be attractive uh, to, to people. And the short answer to the question is, yes, there is some room for hope that XR could adapt uh, itself to the changing context in which we find ourselves. You know, it's two years now since XR was launched. That's two years out of the seven years that XR said we had to uh, to reach uh, near uh, to reach uh, zero biodiversity loss and zero uh, carbon emissions, um, you know that that's a quite high percentage. Uh, it's time for the, for there to be a, a change of focus. I've argued for that within XR without much success to date. Now I'm moving on. There are other people uh, in XR uh, who are still um, arguing for it, and I think their hand will grow stronger. Um, my view is that we need to be doing uh, deep adaptation, and that's why I've, I've done the, the book with you. Um, not because it, uh, I believe that collapse is absolutely inevitable, but because I believe it is uh, probable, and that even if it's only possible, um, we have to be preparing for it, because if we're not prepared for it, it'll be even worse if it comes. Um, my view also very strongly, as you know, is that uh, it's time for transformative uh, adaptation. Uh, and that's going to be an increasing focus of mine uh, over the next year. I'm working with a bunch of people uh, uh, on that, mainly from the sort of activist -y world, uh, many of them in XR or who used to be uh, in XR. Um, and yeah, my hope is that, uh, is that XR will pick up this vibe uh, and start to move more in the direction um, of taking deep, deep adaptation and transformative adaptation Seriously, I think it will happen sooner or later, but it ought to happen sooner. Can you give us an example of what transformative adaptation looks like and why that's worthy of the, the word transformation rather than just standard climate adaptation? Yeah, yeah. So um, one of the things which is nice about your term uh, deep adaptation, Gem, is that you know the natural contrast uh, is with uh, shallow uh, adaptation, which I think is a fair description of the way that the concept of adaptation normally gets into uh, into uh, discourse, into academia, into policy practice, uh, etc. Of course, they don't call it shallow adapt adaptation; <laughs> they call it uh, incremental uh, adaptation or uh, terms like that. That's the UN um, term. Um, and, well, I think it's absolutely clear, um, you know, clear as day that um, while it's good to have people talking about and doing any kind of adaptation to some extent, there is a real danger that incremental adaptation or shallow adaptation is worse than nothing because it's an attempt to keep the current system staggering forward, right? because it means things like um, building uh, higher levees and higher seawalls and basically uh, not engaging in any uh, systemic uh, change. And that could just lead to us going further and building further and further out over the cliff, if you see what I mean. Um, 
So um, we need uh, deeper visions of uh, adaptation and transformative adaptation is one such vision. It originally uh, comes from um, one or two colleagues of mine um, and uh, from the UN uh, and it's been developed to some extent uh, in the academic world. Uh, in terms of uh, on the ground stuff, uh, the kind of example which I um, sometimes like to discuss uh, is in relation to uh, flood defences, etc. You know, if you're going to transformatively adapt rather than uh, uh, building uh, higher seawalls, etc., uh, what you're going to do is you're going to try to restore uh, uh, mangrove swamps, uh, you're going to try to restore uh, wetlands, you're going to um, move uh, with nature rather than trying to fight uh, uh, against nature. You're going to do stuff which is um, uh, mitigational um, uh, at the same time as it involves uh, creating the kind of serious uh, uh, changes, uh, systemic changes uh, that we actually uh, need. Uh, and that's why I think it deserves to have the term, the wonderful term, uh, transformative uh, applied to it. Yes, thank, thank you for that clarity. So where where do you think the opportunity, if, if, if it's not going to be XR necessarily, where's the opportunity for activism of any kind? You know, it could even be within the professional class doing things in their own organisations or in yeah. the UN system rather than necessarily on the street, but, or it could be trade union activists, whatever. Where is there kind of the possibility for action towards transformative adaptation and deep adaptation? Where, or, or who's having that conversation? Should we mm. be having it, for example? Yeah, um, well, I think we should. I think it needs to happen at, at, at every level. Um, and I think we need to be trying to get um, uh, governments, international organizations, etc., to take transformative and deep adaptation uh, a lot more uh, seriously. But I think we can't afford to wait around uh, for that. So that's another aspect of the of the of the sort of more activisty drive that I'm starting to pursue now towards transformative adaptation. That we think of this as something that we try to do, or at least to midwife uh, ourselves. Uh, and what that's going to look like um, is the kind of thing uh, that, say, the transition towns movement uh, has been doing, or permaculturalists, but. Uh, with the dimension, hopefully, of scale, and certainly of uh, a kind of refusal to take uh, no for uh, an answer. Um, in other words, often the transition towns movement has been hobbled by running up um, against uh, the law, uh, regulations, uh, etc. And when that's happened, typically the transition towns folk have said, all right, well, we've got to try to find another way then. Um, it seems to me that we're reaching the point now where if we're going to pursue these visions uh, seriously, beyond um, talking shops, which are super, but you know, not, a, not obviously a solution, uh, then what we need to do is to get more serious about being willing to take the actions necessary to create transformative adaptation, etc. whether or not it's uh, within the prevailing paradigm, whether or not it's within the law. So one might imagine things like um, guerrilla gardening at scale, um, pop-up allotments that get uh, defended against attempts, attempts to take them down, uh, eco-villages uh, uh, likewise. Um, uh, and that would be a really kind of exciting, bold uh, vision, which would build on the kind of uh, achievements of say the, the landless uh, peasants mm -hmm. movements in, uh, in South America, uh, um, but bring that home to, to places like uh, the UK uh, uh, as well. Um, so yeah, I think it needs to happen at every level, but I think we, we can't afford to take no for an answer anymore. Now, uh, in terms of what's gonna bring about um, change at scale, I, I believe that there's a strong case as I've just implied for nonviolent direct action to make transformative adaptation possible where necessary. But I also think that what we've seen over the past few years with the school climate strikes, with Extinction Rebellion, that, needs to be and can be just a small foretaste of what is to come. I think there probably will be and that there needs to be much wider and deeper and bolder uh, nonviolent uh, nonviolent direct action, civil disobedience. Um, my next book um, appearing in January is called Parents for a Future. Uh, and this is a book which uh, imagines um, it's a sort of popular philosophy book that imagines the kind of movement 
that we will actually need if we're going to create civilizational transformation or even really to, to stem significantly the, uh, the collapse towards collapse, uh, if you will. Um, because what I think is that there is the possibility for a movement that would be a sort of counterpart of the youth uh, uh, climate strikers, uh, but among the older generation, and that would be far bigger, maybe a bit less spiky then, and maybe a bit more mainstream then, but still pretty radical, far bigger than Extinction Rebellion. So the book's called uh, Parents for a Future. Um, and if we're gonna have a game changer um, that will actually change what gets done uh, rather than just change the discourse in the wonderful way that uh, the movements of the last couple of years have succeeded in changing the discourse and moving the Overton window. If we're going to have something which actually changes what gets done, I think it, essential to it is going to be a much larger scale uh, civil disobedience um, uh, approach. And, and, and my hunch and my belief and my prayer is that it will be focused around the idea of intergenerational uh, solidarity. In other words, that it will have at its core parents, so grandparents, aunts and uncles, etc. Mm. So you uh, you heard it here first, everyone, or at least I heard it here first. <laughs> for, for me, um, yeah, I uh, I'll be very interested to see what you say in that book, and also um, the invitation that that book is part of. Then for parents to really think, what what can they do? in solidarity with the youth activists. Um, yeah, and, and I think that there is, there is, I'm convinced, I'm absolutely convinced now more than ever, and after the, my experiences of the, of the last few months, you know, the intense um, psycho-spiritual uh, time that I've been having in the aftermath of what started happening to me uh, this summer, I'm more convinced that, than ever that there is enormous potential power here in, once parents really get it that they can't outsource the crisis anymore to scientists or politicians uh, and so on and they get it that no one's riding to the rescue when they get it that they can't safeguard their kids anymore by getting them into a nice school and you know all the sort of usual stuff that the only way that we're going to have um, a better future or a less bad uh, future um, mm. is by um, mass uh, solidarity and transformative system change then I think a, a new kind of um, passion and authenticity uh, enters the, the scene uh, that we haven't seen at, at any kind of scale yet. We've seen mm -hmm. very clear glimpses of it from Greta. We've seen glimpses of it at, at times, I, I, I'm, I'm proud to say, from Extinction Rebellion. But to see, to see if we could see it en masse, if we could feel it en masse from, from parents, God, I think it would be transformative. Yeah, so it's probably a theme that will come up in when when we go to the, the wider Q&A. Um, so I invite anyone who's a parent of a youth activist to uh, to ask a question of Rupert when we come to that. Um, I'm about to come to, to Steve uh, for a question. But before that, Rupert, um, you're quite well known for talking about how this civilization is finished. You have a book called that. Um, I think it might be helpful for, for people to hear what, what do you mean by this civilization being fi finished and, and and how deep does that go and 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 therefore is it inviting a something re a real shift at a foundational level around philosophy about cosmology worldview all, all sorts mm, mm. yeah so yeah well thanks for mentioning that uh, that uh, book of mine which has uh, has been quite a uh, a lovely um, success. It's had a lot more success, frankly, than uh, I anticipated um, when we uh, when we did it. I've just put a link to where you can get a free uh, e-copy of it in in the chat. Um, and um, why has it had so much uh, success? Um, well, I think it's because of the time when it appeared, which was basically around the time when Extinction Rebellion was really kicking off, uh, and because I was saying some stuff that hadn't been. Uh, much said before, you know, obviously there are real connections with stuff that you've been saying, Jim, and a few other uh, people, but it was pretty new and it was it was pretty um, stark. Um, so what was it that I that I meant when I said this civilization is, is finished? Here's, here's the book, this civilization is finished. Uh, um, so I did not mean by that that collapse is absolutely inevitable, but what I did mean is that anything that looks like this civilization um, is not very long for this world. The only question is, how does it finish? 
does it finish uh, through collapse, which is completely the route that we're headed on. And as I said earlier, um, events uh, over the last couple of years have made collapse uh, on balance look more likely rather than less. You know, there have been really hopeful developments, but the, the broad trajectory has been uh, on balance um, uh, negative. Um, does this civilization come to an end through um, a rapid or slow collapse, a, uh, a permanent collapse or a collapse that gets kind of somehow recovered uh, from uh, eventually uh, some kind of civilizational succession? Uh, or is there a chance that we can intelligently um, transform uh, such that the, uh, the energy descent, the system change, et cetera, that we need does not occur by a collapse, does not occur uh, unevenly, does not occur with significant uh, mortality, uh, et cetera. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the book and the, and the YouTube, the viral YouTube talk on which it's uh, based um, uh, is very stark in its message, but continues to keep open a, a little uh, window of, uh, of, of, uh, of hope um, um, for um, a, a happier uh, uh, ending than, than you yourself uh, tend to envisage, Jim, uh, uh, which is obviously one of the interesting parts of the discussion, again, that we've uh, renewed in the Deep Adaptation edited book that's appearing soon. Yeah, and uh, it's been um, interesting. I, I assumed that my certainty on collapse meant that um, I did have a more bleak view. Um, but then I've, I've been reading more and more stuff from indigenous scholars and indigenous activists who sort of point to the awfulness of the so-called normal system, the normal Absolutely. life that we, we benefit yeah. from. And, yeah. and that uh, um, so actually uh, a collapse of global, uh, global capitalism for them may not be such a bad thing. Yes. So uh, that was uh, interesting to come across that, but um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I, I, I do still worry about how just how bad it will be. Um, and, and isn't and, the uh, uh, the point you're making about um, the way that uh, there are aspects of uh, of collapse that could be necessary or good? Isn't that kind of borne out by some of what we've seen in relation to to COVID this year? What I mean is that something which is really uh, depressed me about it is the extent of the momentum towards getting back to normal um, you know the, the 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 strength of the desire to to return to the absolutely crazy ways uh, of living that were you know completely normalized up until about February of this year including things like you know um, uh, jet uh, uh, travel um, the very thing which is uh, uh, which spread the virus uh, uh, so quickly, you know, it doesn't appear that we're very good at, at learning from these things. Of course, there have been mm -hmm. some positive uh, developments, you know, uh, the upsurge in cycling, the fact that air travel actually still is in real uh, trouble uh, around the world, um, a lot of people reconnecting with nature, you know, there's lots uh, of, of good stuff that we can talk about, um, the research yes. of care, the potentiality for intergenerational solidarity. This is a crucial good thing coming from COVID. You know, a lot of what we've done in relation to the coronavirus crisis has been for the sake of the old. It seems to me that there is a possibility, still a real possibility now for us to kind of say, right, well, that has to be turned around now. You know, we did the, made these sacrifices for the sake of the old. Now the older generations have to look to the younger generations in the greater crisis of which uh, the coronavirus crisis was a part, i.e. the ecological uh, long emergency. Um, and that again is behind, partly behind my sort of parents for a future uh, uh, type idea. Um, so, the, so various kind of very real uh, positives, but something deeply depressing about the desire to return to normal when, uh, and the, the failure to recognize just how dire and um, uh, hierarchically unequal and productive of mental illness, and most importantly of all, literally unsustainable uh, uh, normal uh, was and, and is. So we're going to go to questions now. Do you think, I mean, and, and COVID has thrown this up as well, you know, suddenly the, the supermarket shelves were... You Can know, I just summarise the question, Steve, and we'll, we'll so... Yeah. So a question about lifeboats, does it mean localization? Does it mean clubbing together now, preparing? Um, your thoughts on that, Rupert? Thanks, Steve. Precisely. 
yeah yeah so yeah i think you're you're um on the right track very much steve in understanding what i was uh what i was trying to say um the uh the, the, the point is um, that if, um, as seems very likely, uh, governments, etc., are not going to uh, adequately uh, prepare, not going to transformatively adapt, not going to deeply adapt, then we have to make that happen at more local levels, uh, community levels, neighborhood levels, um, street levels, uh, house levels, you know, anything is better than nothing. Although, you know, uh, we're not going to get very far if it's not at minimum uh, at some kind of uh, neighborhood or community uh, type level. So that's the kind of thing we have to do. Now, people sometimes object to me or others saying this by saying, oh, you know, you're abandoning um, the global south, you're abandoning uh, uh, the poor, this is selfish, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. Uh, my reply is to say, well, look, do you have a realistic strategy for uh, converting uh, the whole world and getting adequate uh, action to defend uh, uh, everybody uh, and transform uh, our, our entire uh, global civilization. Uh, if you do, great, you know, show it to me. But I'm very, very skeptical of most of the, the uh, attempts to, to argue that so far. And it's just increasingly clear that we have to have a plan B. Right? I mean, you know, I, I won't take lectures from anybody about, about making efforts to get governments to wake up, etc. You know, I've been absolutely doing that myself for, well, for donkey's years, but especially for the past uh, couple of years. But as I say, we have to be honest uh, about the very limited extent to which that is working. We have to have something of a plan B. Uh, and the, the plan B, it seems to me absolutely clear, has to involve transformative and deep adaptation. Now, the thing is, how do you, how do, you do that? Uh, we've already been talking about that, but to say one more thing about that, um, Jim mentioned the word fair uh, earlier. You know, we can try to build in to the efforts that we make to transformatively adapt as much fairness as possible, as much equality uh, uh, as possible. Um, we can try to make sure that we, whatever it is, you know, create um, 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 pop-up allotments, etc., in ways that uh, that reach out to uh, working-class uh, communities in working-class areas, etc. You know, we can make alliances with people on the on the the HS2 route. You know, there are many possibilities here. Um, and one more point: um, if things do go um, fairly uh, pear-shaped. Um, then it won't be much use to be able to uh, to say to people, well, you know, at least we did our best to try to um, create a, a fair society at the global level or whatever. Of course, we've got to try to to do that, but we have to meaning it when we say that we have to have some kind of plan B means that that hopefully those of us who are, are seeing um, what is likely to be coming and doing something about it and genuinely preparing in the ways that we've just been saying, that we get to carry on. You know, what we really don't want is for things to go pear shape and for those who, uh, who make it through that to be only, you know, um, survivalist uh, militias and, uh, uh, and the alt-right and some of the super rich in, um, uh, in gated communities and so on and so forth. You know, if it is going to come to a very, very difficult future, then we need to make damn sure that there are people moving into that future who are decent people, who are community minded, who are fairness minded, who are serious about um, agroecology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it seems to me that uh, the, the the lifeboat idea is is essential and defensible. We just have to make sure, and I've always said this in, in my work on this, we just have to make sure that the lifeboats maintain a strong sense of ethics and are trying to bring people, if you will, inside the lifeboats and not, not just uh, keeping people out. Yeah, it's important. Uh, it's good to hear you to, to step back as well and talk about so like localization and lifeboats isn't turning away from global solidarity. It, Absolutely. It's, it's yeah. part, of, part of it. And of course, therefore, those lifeboats can seek to prefigure the, the regenerative cultures, the um, cultures of you know, post-patriarchy and such like, you know, real alternative yeah. ways of being day-to-day totally. -day yeah. in their And I think their we're already getting a little sense of that from, um, well, sometimes from the Deep Adaptation Forum, 
uh, and certainly sometimes from um, Extinction Rebellion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, I would invite Extinction Rebellion to think about well, how can that direction be moved in further? How can we have more regenerativity? Can we can there be a, a sort of alliance with transformative adaptation and with all the, the groups that that could create a kind of broader alliance with? That mm. seems to me an exciting possibility in the challenge yeah, good. We're moving into. So we have a question from uh, Talia. Um, I don't know if I pronounced your name right, but uh, please unmute um, and over uh, to you. Yeah, Talia. Um, so I just wanted to very, very quickly just say that my vision that I come back to the whole time is if I've been thrown out of the boat and I'm just about to sink and there's five of us holding on to the, the, the life ring, I want to be in a good relationship with those people. And so that's what keeps me going is that kind of, um, uh, that commitment to the, the love and compassion between people. So that's my little vision. And if it helps anyone yeah. else, that's cool. But my question was, you talked about incremental mitigation, uh, incremental adaptation as not really being um, uh, really worth it. And I just wondered if that would be what you would say about incremental mitigation as well. Mm. So um, let me first say something about your your vision of the of the five people holding onto the life ring together because I think it's very moving uh, vision. Yeah, I totally agree. And what it brings to mind for me um, is uh, some words of Joanna Macy's. So Joanna Macy is a is a teacher of of mine, someone who's been very important to me for many years. Uh, in uh, I've worked with her, and she's helped me through eco despair and so on and so forth. She, uh, like me, has become more pessimistic uh, in recent years about our chances of getting uh, through uh, what's coming without some kind of um, um, collapse uh, event or events. Um, and she was asked in an interview not that long ago, um, and she talks about this kind of thing, by the way, in her piece in the book that Gem and I uh, are doing with Polity Press on deep adaptation. She was asked in an interview not that long ago, um, Joanna, what, how do you manage to keep on going, given that you've become, you know, quite pessimistic about our chances of getting through this without uh, collapse? You know, why do you still do what you do? Where do you find the energy and the passion? And what she said was, um, look, the real reason why I'm doing this now is so uh, if and when this time that I think is likely comes, that you won't turn on each other. I just think that's so moving and so deeply kind of important and, and true. So yeah, we need to, we need to be working now to, uh, to, to create the relationships and community and the attitudes and the, and the spirit uh, such that uh, we won't turn on each other uh, in, uh, in the times that are coming. Uh, and, and now on your question, mm. um, basically that my answer to the question is, is yes. Um, I think it's self-evident that incremental mitigation is, not, is, no, is no good either because the best that that will do is keep an unsustainable system staggering on uh, a few years longer. Um, so um, we, re we direly desperately need um, transformative uh, uh, adaptation, which as I say, includes uh, mitigation. We need um, system change um, to the extent that we are unlikely to get it. We need also to be thinking very intelligently and seriously about plan B's and plan C's and the way we've been talking about. Just want to follow that up, Rupert, in terms of the, the concern you have that uh, that we don't just sort of stumble on and, and say, oh, aren't we doing well with these incremental steps to cut carbon, but also to yeah. draw down carbon. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on the sort of the, the new buzz term of climate restoration, which seems to be an umbrella for um, both super stuff, conservation, rewilding, agroecology, and all those good things, but also includes uh, um, negative emission technologies, you know, direct air, direct carbon capture from the air and such like. What are your, yeah. what are your thoughts on, because it seems to be that's going to be the big thing of next year as, as, as uh, the IPCC tell us that we're in a, we're in a really difficult situation. Is, is it just grasping, grasping at techno straws? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I think it is grasping it to uh, techno straws. I mean, I'm all in favor of genuine restoration. We absolutely need restoration of uh, wild biodiverse uh, uh, ecosystems. That's, that's fundamental. Uh, although we, we should be cautious uh, 
given recent research results in assuming that they're going to succeed in bringing down as much uh, carbon as we would like. Um, but uh, the, the great thing about them is that they're, they're safe uh, and they, they move in the right direction in all sorts of ways. Um, mm. I'm very concerned about uh, negative emissions technologies, so-called, which are basically just a form of uh, geoengineering um, because of the potential uh, recklessness of them uh, and they go against the precautionary principle and because of the, the potential moral hazard uh, in that there is a very real danger that they will give people an excuse for, for, for pursuing merely incremental mitigation uh, and adaptation uh, uh, policies rather than the kind of transformation uh, that we need. So yeah, I think there's going to be more and more talk of, uh, of uh, negative emissions technologies uh, and we'll see some uh, implemented. I think it's good that we talk about them, partly because it brings home the reality uh, of just how dire the situation is. And right. because it may be that some of them um, are, are workable. You know, we have to have a, 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 mm -hmm. an evidence-based attitude here as well as a precautionary uh, attitude. Yes. But my fundamental attitude is one of skepticism uh, and of nervousness that, that this is going to point us in the wrong direction and is going to be an attempt again to just keep the current system staggering forward you know that mm. that's the, the the real the real worry that, that, that this they, is the problem they, isn't it yeah yeah i mean it's it's that it's not that the individual things themselves might be bad but if they if they're part of a narrative around that you know modernity continues in its current form yeah. global capitalism can keep on in its current form then of, of course it's it means that we're not really facing up to what's got us into this mess but on this issue of where we're at scientifically robert you have a question for for rupert my question really is um uh, sort of linked to the charles eisenstein um idea from his uh, climate and news story um my question is is the achieving of collective solidarity as you as you mentioned is that an aesthetic challenge and and, and i'll just segue into um, a recent article in the guardian where um teachers and i'm a teacher secondary school teacher were told that they mustn't do anything which could be deemed to be anti-capitalist and i'm wondering if the aesthetic challenge there is is something which you know we're not going to be able to achieve unless we address uh, things which is, I guess links to what Jem's just been saying about capitalism and uh, and all of that. So it, it, do you feel that the, the mindset change that requ required to achieve that level of solidarity as we transition um, into this transformative adaptation uh, is an aesthetic challenge? And if so, uh, how do we go about achieving it? Uh, if we think about, you know, the Adorno uh, idea of the culture machine and how that sort of props up the capitalist regime and so on. That's that's my question. Thank you. Am I back? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, well, very interesting. Obviously, absolutely huge uh, question. Um, so I can only take on one or two um, aspects of it, really, in, in the short time uh, that we have. Thank you for your, your kind words uh, at the start of the question. Also, uh, I would say in reply to those, please uh, don't uh, leave me and, and my colleagues uh, alone uh, in this, right? What we need is far, far larger numbers of people who are, who are trying to do the, the kind of thing that I've been trying to do and that XR has been trying to do in the past couple of years. And uh, hopefully, you know, a lot of people on this call, a lot of people watching this video uh, may get uh, involved in um, a Parents for a Future type, uh, type movement, uh, et cetera. So look, yes. Um, I think it's clear, absolutely clear, that we need uh, system change, that we need uh, transformation. And in fact, I can put the point more strongly. Um, the, the reason why I say this civilization is finished is that we're going to get uh, system change. The question is, are we going to get that change through some kind of more or less intelligent voluntary process? Or are we going to get it through a chaotic collapse? Or are we going to get it through something uh, in between? Um, so. Um, uh, vast uh, change uh, is coming. Um, uh, most of what the, the current system is trying to do is to hold off uh, that change and it is not going to succeed. It is not going to succeed. So yeah, um, sure there is an aesthetic dimension, there is a cultural uh, dimension. Um, uh, one of the things I talk about in Parents for a Future is the way that um, films, some films have got quite close to thinking well uh, about this. Uh, in recent years. I'm very interested in the success of uh, Avatar, for example, which I've uh, written about, um, which uh, I think it's very exciting that that 
became the the biggest grossing film uh, of all uh, time. Um, and um, uh, I'd love to talk uh, all day uh, about this, but uh, I fear we don't have the, the time um, for that. I will just mention uh, another book, if I may, which is, uh, I wasn't really expecting to mention, but as soon as you brought it up, this is just out in paperback, A Film Philosophy of Ecology and Enlightenment. Uh, and this is a more academic book, but I'm hoping it's popularly accessible, um, where I talk about exactly this, um, um, aesthetic and cultural dimension of the challenge before us. And, and I urge um, artists uh, generally and writers to kind of step up more. I think we, we need a, a much deeper engagement, for example, in, uh, in television um, uh, with, the, uh, with the emergency, which is now our more or less uh, permanent condition. And then if we had that engagement, if we had, you know, a hundred avatars like all across the arts, um, all across culture, um, then uh, our situation would be more hopeful than it is. Thank you, Rupert. We've got the final question from uh, from David. David Bent, over to you. Hi, Rupert. Hi, Jem. And thanks very much for, as ever, very stimulating, very thorough, rigorous, uh, and so on um, comments. My question, in a way, goes back to your opening uh, situation and what you described. So. What would you mm -hmm. say to those who say that, that, yes, there is a massive challenge of climate change, but the threat of collapse read of the evidence is driven more by the psychology of those who come to that conclusion than it is by a read of the evidence. How do we know that the full direness of the situation is not just in our minds? Um, okay, yeah, uh, and um, certainly there are lots of people trying to say that. Um, my view is that is that it's uh, it's very likely that the opposite uh, uh, is the case. That actually we're that, that we're trying to stave off um, the uh, the, the dynamics of the reality. I mean, and by we, I mean even like us on 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 this uh, on this video call. Um, you know, I, I'm continually uh, looking for uh, hope to. Um, um, to technical developments, scientific developments, the success of, uh, of uh, what my friend and colleague Greta has started, the successes of Extinction Rebellion and so on. And then periodically I sort of get brought up with a kind of reality check and this is what happened to me this summer and realize, my God, you know, what we've achieved is, is, so, is so minute compared to how things are grindingly getting worse. And now our attention is so strongly on the, the coronavirus crisis without seeing it usually in its proper context as part of the ecological uh, uh, emergency. You know, it just wouldn't have happened without, you know, cruelty to animals and habitat destruction and above all um, uh, jet planes all over the place, uh, etc. And our attention is so taken up with the coronavirus crisis now and time is passing, you know, again, time is passing. Another year goes by as a vaccine gets rolled out and maybe a successful, maybe not, et cetera. It's another year that we don't have to address the eco and climate emergency uh, seriously. So I honestly think that the, the boot is, is on the, the other foot. Um, I honestly think that uh, it's more likely that someone like me uh, is underestimating uh, how bad things are than overestimating it. And that's why that's why we need to look after ourselves, right? That's why we need to make sure that, that we don't end up um, getting uh, burnt out, that we don't end up getting thrown into, into a, a state of sort of constant anxiety and being able to, unable to sleep well, et cetera. And partly because, you know, there, there still isn't nearly enough broad awakening to this situation. But look, the real answer I have to your question, and I'm not going to attempt to, to go into the, the facts and so on, and Jem has done wonderful work in kind of bringing together material that shows some of the very difficult trends now facing us. I'd also recommend strongly the work of the Collapsologists, which is now being translated into English and has been in some cases. Um, for me, the, the real answer to your question uh, comes down to the precautionary principle, which is at the heart of much of uh, of my work. Yeah, that's very nice. Thank you. Yeah, that's the collapsologist's uh, uh, key uh, work, uh, How Everything Can Collapse uh, by Savine and Stevens. Um, for me, uh, a lot of this comes down to the precautionary principle, right? Even if it's only possible, merely possible, merely something that's reasonable to worry about, 
um, uh, that uh, that we're headed uh, potentially towards uh, collapse. Um, then we ought to be investing so much more in really seriously guarding against that, trying to stop it uh, from happening.